there, there are definitely still, still folks uh, joining us uh, currently, but uh, why don't I kick off with a, a bit of an introduction and, and then we can get going. Um, so I'm Kelly Kobe. I'm an investigator and the publications officer here in Ottawa at the Centre for Journalology. Our group hosts a speaker series annually, and this is the, the, the third of the series for this year. And I think we've got a, a really exciting uh, a day or session for you guys. So uh, today we're, we're going to be speaking of, about preprints and everything you need to know about them from a, a medical research perspective in, in one hour for what's possible. And, and we're really grateful uh, for you all uh, sharing your time with us to, to be here today. And in particular to our speakers, uh, Dr. Jessica Polka and Dr. John Inglis for, for sharing their time and expertise as well. So how the session is going to work today is that uh, uh, Jessica and John will, will give a, a brief talk. And then at the end, uh, we're going to have a, a hopefully about 20 minutes for a little Q&A session and we can have a bit of a discussion there. So I, I don't want to delay uh, the, the sharing of, of the talk and the excitement. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, Dr. Polka first and then Dr. Inglis after Jessica. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Jessica Polka serves as Executive Director of ASA Bio, which is a research-driven nonprofit organization working to promote innovation and transparency in life science publishing in the areas of preprints and open peer review. Uh, prior to this, she performed postdoc research in systems biology at Harvard Medical School and had done her PhD in biochemistry and cell biology uh, from UCSF. Um, sorry, I'm just going to interrupt there. Uh, my apologies, Jessica. There's a few folks who are not muted. So if, if you could just check your uh, actually muted uh, as a participant. Uh, sorry again. So uh, Dr. Uh, Polka, beyond those commitments, is also a Plan S ambassador, uh, an affiliate of the Knowledge Futures Group, and a steering committee member of Restoring Biomedical Research. So uh, it's, it's really wonderful to have you today and, and uh, to get to know you and, and for you to share your expertise with us. Uh, on, on preprints and the sort of basics of making them and distributing them. Thank you and I'll, I'll pass it over to you and welcome you to share your slide. Thank you so much, Kelly. I appreciate the invitation to speak with you and I'm really looking forward to the conversation today. So um, hopefully you're able to see my slides now, if that's correct, okay. Uh, great, so um, you know, just as a little bit of um, additional background, you know, ASAP Bio really works by uh, convening different stakeholders together to talk about the issues surrounding open communication. And, you know, certainly I think that one thing that really guides us is this perception, this, this fact really, that human knowledge is dependent upon the public release of other knowledge. Um, that um, in many ways, the delays um, to discoveries are exacerbated by individual delays of publishing and sharing that work out. Um, and this is you know, particularly a challenge given that our founder Ron Vale found that over the past 30 years, there's been an increase in a particular graduate program's time to graduation, time to first author publication. So it is now taking grad students over a year longer to come out with their first sort of publishable unit. Um, and over the same period, the number of panels and figures within individual papers has also increased dramatically, especially when supplemental information is taken into account. Um, and I think, you know, one reason for this is that uh, the act of publishing in the traditional journal system is not simply a uh, you know, dispassionate dissemination of work to the community. It's also tied up with peer review and curation. Um, and so, of course, as you'll hear from uh, John later uh, today, and as I'm sure you're all aware already, preprints really separate this act of dissemination from the peer review and curation steps. And this enables a public version of a manuscript, which in the typical case is very similar to what people would post, uh, would submit to a journal. Um, to be made available within a short period of time in a public version that is free to access, it's citable, it can be updated um, by the authors, and is open to community feedback, ideas, and discussion during the time that this paper would otherwise be hidden from public view in the traditional journal peer review process. Um, and in doing so, this saves months or possibly even years in the process of getting those results out to others in the community 
who can react to them, who can provide additional perspectives, and who can use those results to advance their own work. Um, so data from Europe PMC, which has been indexing um, now the full text of preprints, shows that there's a median of four to five months between um, the journal uh, publication and first preprint posting, which is consistent with the way that preprints are typically used uh, as, a, as a way of sharing that first version uh, that is submitted to a journal. So the benefits of preprints, this is from a wonderful um, <laughs> survey uh, that John um, and R Richard conducted a bioarchive that they increase the awareness of research um, they uh, stake a pri helped authors to stake a priority claim and really engage uh, the community in a richer and deeper way. Uh, and from a, another survey that we conducted, I think that these benefits don't just accrue to individual authors, but as an entire scientific community, uh, people perceive that preprints increase the speed of communication um, and they provide early feedback and enable sharing you know, in a way that is free to both post and to read, which I think is really valuable. So this is you know, some of the reasons that preprinting has grown so dramatically over uh, the past years in the life sciences, um, especially with the dramatic growth of Med Archive over um, in COVID-19, which I know uh, John will, will uh, share about later as well. Um, but this has been driven, I think, by a lot of supportive funder policies. Both private and public funders have acknowledged that preprints can be cited in grant applications and reports, and the integration of preprints into a kind of knowledge um, infrastructure when we think about European C, Crossref, and now even PubMed is indexing preprints from NIH-funded authors relevant to COVID-19. So there is definitely, I think, in, the, in this biomedical space, a um, increasing acceptance of preprints um, as highly visible form of communication. So in the um, last uh, you know, few minutes, I just want to describe um, uh, a couple topics. One is, what are the practical considerations that someone might want to take into account when deciding to preprint? And second, what might the future preprints look like? Um, so I, one of the, the uh, things that we do at ASAP Bio is try to help um, collect resources for people who are interested in the concept of preprinting. And um, so this uh, little sequence comes from this, this FAQ. So you know, I think one of the, the first um, issues with preprinting is to understand that Preprints are really embraced by the large majority of journals um, in the life sciences. Yet, I think it's also important to be aware of journal policies uh, in particular when considering uh, how to preprint. Um, so Sherpa Romeo is a really fantastic resource for, for this that I'm sure that all of you are completely aware of. Um, but we have also attempted to categorize more detailed information such as uh, when preprints can specifically be posted, um, which is quite nuanced across different journals. For example, Nature Research permitting preprints to be posted at any time, while other publishers advise uh, posting only the first version. So the second, I think, is considering the server. And um, obviously, I think for <laughs> you know, in medicine, med archive. Um, is a clear, uh, highly visible choice, and as is BioArchive. But depending on discipline, there are many other um, servers that uh, address not only disciplinary differences, but also language, um, and also uh, serve different communities. So we have collected uh, a, a directory of preprint server policies and practices which is updated by the servers uh, on our website. And this enables uh, you to, I think, learn about in a, in a uh, um, perhaps um, more, you know, in a single place, these different policies that may otherwise be spread across uh, the internet as well. So the third issue that I want to highlight is <laughs> choosing a license. Um, this is something that I think is really important to discuss with co-authors before submitting. 
um, you know, I think that this is really in preprints one of the first times that every single author has an opportunity to make a decision about Creative Commons licenses that they may wish to apply. Um, and so this is, I think, an unprecedented level at many servers of freedom to authors in making a choice. Um, I think that there's a uh, not a lot of um, perhaps um, understanding evenly throughout the entire community about what the licenses mean or what, um, what they might permit. So we've created some resources that uh, work to explain how licenses can affect what might be done with your preprint in the future. And just to highlight the fact that um, these are choices that are available to you at BioArchive and MedArchive, as well as other servers as well. Um, and that all of these different terms, uh, for example, non-commercial, no derivatives, share alike, can be added on to this uh, Creative Commons license in different ways. Um, so we, um, you know, I think that having this conversation with your co-authors and what you're comfortable with can enable you to make your work as open as you are comfortable uh, with. So I think that another challenge that um, you know, we can certainly discuss is the, the, the notion of actually introducing the concept of preprinting. This is something that um, not all authors are uh, currently preprinting. And you know, there's, I think, a, a, a question of how to even begin having these conversations. Um, people within the ASAPA community have discussed the concept of you know, discussing preprints and other settings, um, seeking the experience of colleagues who are within the same field or the same institution, how preprinting is really like. Um, and to help with this, we have some infographics, some FAQ that already so that you have a real complete disclosure of the of the work available. And finally, I mean, there's really the beyond posting it and having that kind of celebratory experience. I think that requesting feedback is also a really valuable and important uh, thing to consider when preprinting. For example, I just want to share this experience from Dan Quintana, who posted a, uh, a, a his preprint. I think this is a, a discussion group in psychology, and there is this incredibly rich conversation that has happened. And certainly, these these uh, conversations can happen on Twitter and in the comment section of BioArchive, as well as other places as well. Um, that uh, have certainly grown, especially in light of COVID nineteen, um, but. Uh, it, this actually resulted in Dan finding a collaborator, which enabled him to update the paper. So I think explicit requests for feedback can be something that um, can in, engender a lot more conversation and feedback than would uh, happen otherwise. So um, just to end in the last few minutes here, um, what what does the future of preprints? look like? I mean, I think John is going to talk about um, the uh, effect of COVID-19 in much greater depth, but um, just to say that um, COVID-19 preprints are shorter um, and have fewer references and are updated more frequently, or at least, um, you know, especially early in the pandemic. And I think this speaks to the response to a need to share information rapidly which is something that is uh, you know, really enabled by preprints in a way that uh, you know, is potentially transformative. So many, um, as I mentioned earlier, I think that now the kind of standard practice is to submit a preprint at the same time as a journal submission. And just to use a, um, a preprint here as an example, um, these authors actually posted the first version of their preprint, which had fewer figures, not the, the complete story that was eventually published um, in August of 2020, but they posted this far earlier, ensuring that their work was visible and citable and could actually accelerate knowledge and accrue to the authors all of the benefits that we've discussed about increased visibility and feedback and opportunities to improve work. 
So, you know, I think that there's a p- tremendous potential to use preprints as a vehicle for sharing work well ahead of journal submission and to use it, use them as a, a way to um, really share work that is well ahead of a journal article. Um, and this is something that I think would has potential to really accelerate discovery, uh, promote more collaboration, and um, really, I think, transform scientific communication in a very positive way. So um, with that, I just want to thank all of my uh, fantastic colleagues at ASAP Bio. Thank you for your attention. I'm looking forward to uh, John's, John's remarks, remarks and the conversation that will follow. Thanks again. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Jessica. That was really fantastic and, and expertly delivered. Uh, if, if you've not checked out the website from ASAP Bio, you really should. It's, it's, I really think you guys are doing a great service for the community. There's a lot of resources there. I know I certainly benefit from myself. Um, so, so again, thank you so much. Um, I'm sure there's lots of questions or comments or, or, or thoughts for Jessica, but uh, we're going to move on to the second speaker and then we'll open it up for a discussion uh, at that point. So uh, next up, as mentioned, is Dr. John Inglis. So he's co-founder of BioArchive and MedArchive, Cold Spring Harbor's lab- Laboratories Preprint Services for the Life and Health Sciences. He's also the founding executive director and publisher of Cold Spring Harbor's Laboratory Press in New York, which is a nonprofit uh, publisher for journals, books, and online media in molecular and cell biology. He's the current chair uh, of the board of directors of the Life Science Alliance, a joint publishing advent- uh, venture of Cold Spring Harbor Local. You might find this interesting. Rockefeller University and MBO, and serves as the advisory boards on MIT Press and the Research and Research Institute. Uh, he graduated from the University of Edinburgh Medical School with a PhD in immunology, and was previously assistant editor of The Lancet, founder of Trends in Immunology and Trends in Parasitology, and managing editor of the Trends Journals. So uh, lots of expertise and experience uh, to bring uh, to the fore of today's discussion. And, uh, today, uh, John will be speaking specifically about uh, bioarchive and medarchive and changes and experiences in wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, welcome, John. Thank you for your time and expertise, and I'd invite you to share your slides as well. Oh, muted. Yes, thank you very much, Kelly, for the very kind introduction, and thank you for the invitation to be here and to share the platform with Jessica. That's always a pleasure. Uh, as you say, ASAP Bio does a really terrific uh, job um, in all the various ways that it operates. Um, so here, I hope, are my slides. Um, uh, as you have said, I'm privileged to be part of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, which has a 120 year history of innovation in research and education in science and the communication of science. And um, I'm also privileged to be the PI on the grants that support our preprint servers, uh, BioArchive and MedArchive. So I am talking today on behalf of a really fantastic group of people. Uh, who put together um, these servers, work with the content, make the policies uh, and keep everything going. And last year they collectively posted 52,000 manus- uh, papers on, uh, on our servers. So they deserve all the credit for the remarks that I'm going to make. Um, as you all know, um, the research community worldwide has mobilized as never before in response to the pandemic. And I really like this quote from Jacob Dykes in a recent uh, magazine article, um, science has never been more important to our daily lives. Um, And uh, the NIH tracks the volumes of outputs of uh, COVID research in one of these projects. It has several, but the COVID-19 portfolio has 132,000 outputs, uh, most of them journal articles, but preprints have been uh, a substantial proportion of uh, of those outputs. And there is a list of uh, all the preprint servers that they are tracking. As Jessica has said, there are a very large number of preprint servers these days. Um, But um, MedArchive really uh, began in uh, in June of 2019. So it was only really six months old when the pandemic hit and then all kinds of uh, extraordinary things happened. Um, It uh, 
is a community-based not-for-profit uh, enterprise. It's funded by the lab and by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. And we are very lucky with MedArchive to be able to co-manage it with two very experienced uh, clinical publishing uh, colleagues, Theo Bloom and, and Claire Rollinson, and two professors of medicine at Yale, Harlan Krumholz and Joe Ross. And their expertise has really been essential in the management of MedArchive. It's not a product, it's not a publication, it's, an, it's a service that is provided by an institution that's used to providing services to the research community. It is independent of journals and publishers, but we work closely with both. It's free to everyone to read and to post. And um, the papers, uh, there is a screening process, which I'll uh, talk about in a second. We aim for rapid posting, 48 hours, um, and that is possible. Uh, it can be revised at any time, up to the time it's uh, published by a journal. And we have various arrangements with journals to transfer manuscripts in and out of Med Archive and, uh, and uh, resources for the use of the content. I'm rushing through this because there is, I want to make sure to leave enough time for discussion. So I just, I've listed here a whole variety of reasons why we do not take particular kinds of manuscripts at MedArchive. It is not, as some like to say, a free-for-all. Um, there is a rather an intense uh, screening process which involves a multi-step process of um, various kinds of experts, including working clinicians and scientists, and also the last step of clinician editors. So um, it is not um, a given that your manuscript no, no, is not working anyway. by Med Archive. And in fact, in the months of 2020, we, uh, somewhat to my surprise, I discovered we declined 20 to 40% of our submissions. So um, uh, the manuscripts that uh, we did post uh, grew strikingly in 2020. As you can see, we went from having 200 manuscripts in January uh, of 2020 to 2000 in May of 2020. And that, as I will show you, is nearly all driven by COVID related uh, manuscripts. So um, in total, Ned Archive now has 18,000 papers um, with uh, over 100,000 uh, authors from many countries. Um, 14,000 of those papers arrived last year. And the largest fields, not surprisingly, are uh, infectious disease and epidemiology, but there is also growth in a variety of other medical disciplines. Usage also spiked uh, roughly according to the uh, number of posts and reached over 10 million in April and settled down to around five to six million um, abstract views uh, each, uh, each month. So this is a breakdown of the pandemic related uh, preprints as opposed to other topics, as you can see in each of the months um, that uh, from the beginning of 2020, the uh, posts have been dominated by pandemic related work. And in total um, of all the manuscripts that have been posted since the pandemic began, 68% um, were about the pandemic. And they varied, of course, um, in their origins. This is a breakdown of the, the country of origin of these preprints. What is most striking is that in the early part of 2020, there was a surge of manuscripts from China, which peaked earlier than the, the manuscripts from every other country, and then died away as um, the pandemic became more controlled uh, in China. Um, and also perhaps um, there was some rethinking about um, the nature of those communications. Um, but a lot of the early work um, on the pandemic did, did come out of the research community in China. Um, the question often arises, as Jessica has, um, has told us, um, do preprints really have scientific value? And I thought this was just one piece of evidence that was quite striking. This is a, a paper published in Nature Review Immunology last month uh, in which um, Akiko Iwasaki and her colleagues basically list milestones in COVID-19 research. And in their 168 citations, 12 are directly to preprints 
and 42 of those citations are journal articles that have that started their life as a preprint on a preprint server. And so I, I, I think we could argue quite cogently that pandemic related preprints have contributed significantly both to the scientific understanding of the biology of the virus, the nature of the disease that it causes, um, diagnostic intervention, treatments, and um, even some influence on national policies uh, throughout the world. And I've just listed here some of the topics that have been dealt with in um, med archive uh, preprints. And perhaps I could just call out one of the, the recovery trials um, from Oxford, of which there have been several posted on med archive, but the one about dexamethasone was what really um, alerted the world to the therapeutic value of using de dexamethasone in treating patients. And that very, very quickly became a standard of care um, even before the paper itself was published uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine. Other ways, <clears throat> other ways of measuring impact include citations, um, social media mentions of which there has been a gigantic number, news stories, and, and um, the uh, altmetric scores of the, the top 50 um, preprints. So um, one interesting observation is that, um, as Jessica's uh, research paper um, uh, confirmed, we, from our own data, observed that, that uh, COVID-related preprints were published faster than non-pandemic related preprints. And that was true of BioArchive and MedArchive. And the, even though these are really separate activities um, in many respects, the data are strikingly similar. Um, the question often arises too about, well, how much difference does peer review actually make? And in Josh Wallach's uh, analysis of this published in JAMA Network Open, uh, where they looked at 75 preprint and journal article comparisons, um, of which 60% were COVID related, they really found no significant changes in the interpretation in the, in the, pa in the published paper or in the details of the manuscript. And, and Jessica's work with her colleagues uh, supports that uh, conclusion. Um, and she's already mentioned this uh, PLOS biology paper from uh, Nicholas Fraser and colleagues in which um, it was clear that pandemic related preprints were downloaded more often, shared more widely and also cited more often. However, we are very aware that a preprint server has work of highly variable quality. And um, when that happens, there can be consequences. Here are just three examples. Um, a, a, a notorious paper about uh, seroprevalence that um, attracted, as you can see, 577 comments on the site, most of them not very complimentary, and resulted in some modifications to the subsequent versions of the paper, and then two withdrawn articles, um, which basically were withdrawn by authors because of the um, vehemence of community comment on the way that they had conducted the work or analyzed it. So in all 29 of the 14,000 pandemic related preprints on our two servers have been withdrawn. They've been withdrawn by the authors themselves for several reasons, which I have listed here. Um, some of it um, an acknowledgement of flawed analysis, some of it a, a retrospective realization that um, there was um, something wrong with the information that had been presented, which might have included um, IRB approval or inappropriate patient data. One consequence of um, the outpouring of uh, preprints uh, last year was the um, need to find ways of identifying um, reliable, um, workable uh, 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 research information that could be perhaps clinically applicable. And several projects sprang up spontaneously to try to um, achieve that goal. Um, and I've, I've listed several of, of them here. I don't, we could talk about them in more detail if you would like to do that. Um, this in turn is having knock-on effects on the way that journals are thinking about uh, peer review. And eLife in particular, is in the 
uh, vanguard of this kind of thinking with a new policy, which will come into effect in July, which says that they will only consider for publication an article which has been posted to a preprint server. And there are, is a great deal of discussion about the pos possible emergence of a new generation of journals, which takes as a given the fact that the content already disseminated and then provides peer review and curation and context um, after the um, wide dissemination of the information itself. And we are working on improvements in how we link from individual preprints to um, the conversation and discussion that goes on around that particular manuscript. So um, I've skated through this very quickly. Um, I think we could all agree that COVID-19, unlike say SARS or MERS, is the first pandemic that has had a significant degree of preprinting. Um, we believe that this has really enabled faster uh, accumulation of knowledge that has been useful in terms of managing the pandemic that has also prompted international collaborations. Um, most of the pandemic related preprints were released on servers that, that have declared responsible screening procedures. And this is an example of the kind of notice that we posted and other servers have done similar sorts of things. Um, I think medical journals were already beginning to come to grips with uh, preprints, but the pandemic has certainly increased their willingness to consider such manuscripts. And journals did a remarkably good job in many cases of speeding up their peer review processes in order to get important work out uh, quickly. However, not all preprints are intended for journals. And what preprint servers are about is really scientific progress, not necessarily publication. And I think that's an important thing to make, a distinction to make. Many of the manuscripts on MedArchive were really dispatches from the front lines of science and medicine and uh, were updated or overtaken by events. So as I have said, the, the outpouring of preprints has prompted um, new approaches, new thinking about peer review. And another consequence of what happened last year is that journalists now had access to all of the newest research on the pandemic, and they had to learn how to deal with that, how to report it responsibly and with appropriate caution. So I, my argument is that in the last few years, early and open sharing of research has moved towards the mainstream. We're not in the mainstream yet, but it is moving towards the mainstream of how the research community works. And as a consequence, and particularly as a consequence of last year, the public has become much more aware of how science actually works. And I love this quote from Ed Yong and use it at every opportunity. Science, he portrays as a slow erratic stumble towards ever less uncertainty. What a great phrase. And that is the last thing I will say. Thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, uh, John. Really, really fantastic. It's quite striking to see the, the numbers and, and the shifts uh, in, in preprints with the pandemic. Uh, it's, it's hard to imagine that, you know, we didn't have this server a couple of years ago, MetArchive, in, in our space. Um, well, th thank you both again for your talks. I think I, I've certainly learned a lot and I hope others have as well. Um, we do have lots of time for questions now, which is really great. There's some um, coming through through the chat. So I'm going to start off picking off some of the questions that we, we've seen in the chat and posing them to uh, Jessica and John. And uh, others, feel free to uh, add questions there, or you can also raise your hand and, and I'll call on you if, if you'd like to engage in a verbal discussion as well. Um, but maybe to, to start things off, um, there is a question here from Alana LeBlanc, who's also in Ottawa, but at Health Canada. And she asked, and I think you spoke to this uh, a little bit, uh, John, but maybe you'd like to expand or Jessica share your perspective. Uh, given how many pandemic related posts and how much COVID has drawn attention to preprints, do you think the popularity of preprints will continue after COVID becomes less central to our lives? So John, why don't you take a, a stab at that to begin? Well, obviously we, we hope so. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I think, um, I think 
not to get any um, pleasure from the tragic events of the past year, but I think one perhaps positive demand embraces preprints, they do not go back. This was an observation made by um, Paul Ginsberg, who was the founder of the Physics and Math Archive, um, and saw the spread of preprinting practice through the different disciplines of physics. And we have seen medical editors and practitioners that maybe the risks of preprints can be diminished, maybe not avoided entirely, but diminished. So I hope that will, persuasion will continue. Excellent. And Jessica, do you have anything to add? No, I think that was an excellent summary. Um, I just to say that even, you know, the, the awareness of preprints beyond the scientific science has done, I think is very healthy. And so my, yeah, my hope is that um, John's uh, prediction holds true. Excellent. Uh, okay, so I'm just making my way through. There's a comment here from Brian Alper uh, for folks to check out the COVID-19 Knowledge Accelerator project as well, which is related uh, to, to some of the discussion. And, and there's a question, uh, another question from uh, Sarah Melville, and she, she's uh, also thanking you for your presentations, but uh, she's asking uh, to, to summarize uh, when it is safe to upload a preprint, especially if the position of the gold journal is unclear or not in favor of preprints. And she wants to know practically a bit about how to deal with this type of ambiguity uh, and avoiding having a manuscript subsequently being rejected due to a preprint. Maybe Jessica, we'll start with you. Sure. Um, you know, I think that many um, journals are, uh, have, are updating their websites to include explicit, uh, to explicitly address the question of preprints and their preprint policies. And I think that kind of transparency is really, really important. Um, so, you know, certainly I think that it would be, you know, reasonable to perhaps contact uh, editors and inquire about the policy and, you know, perhaps also, um, it indicates how I think helpful it is to have these policies out in the open. Um, I think that once a policy is out in the open and stated um, in a clear way that really benefits authors at all stakeholders. And it also provides an opportunity for the conversation to be had um, in, a, in a more um, public and transparent way in the sense that, you know, perhaps other authors and editorial board members um, can then raise the issue uh, in a in a um, in a more direct fashion. So yes, I would encourage this this tra that transparency of policy as a way to begin that conversation. Thank you. Uh, anything to add to that, John? No, I think uh, Jessica is absolutely right, um, and I think it's a, it probably is wise to contact a journal if you have any uncertainty. But I think the only thing I would add is that the four major commercial publishers who collectively control an enormous proportion of all the journals in that um, we are likely to use, um, they are all, they have all um, explicitly uh, expressed support for the use of preprints. And what we have found is that that information doesn't always percolate through to individual journal editors. And it is possible sometimes for us to contact the representatives of these commercial publishers and say, hey, we've heard about a problem with a particular manuscript and they nearly always take care of that. But I think contacting the, uh, the uh, journal editor in advance is, if you have uncertainty, is, is a good policy. Okay, thank you. There's a further question um, related to mine further down from Sarah McLean, just related to this. Are there any um, guides or best practices for, uh, uh, around preprinting and preprints that you would suggest? Well, I would point you to ASAP Mayo's website. It's full okay. of uh, extraordinarily valuable information. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank uh, you. The, the next question uh, comes in uh, asking about, uh, a little bit about indexing. So folks want to know if preprints are searchable through Medline or PubMed. Pub so maybe, maybe John, you can uh, take a stab at that from 
your server's perspectives? Yeah, um, so there's a good deal of change going on in this area uh, at the moment. Um, so um, pub, as, as Jessica said, uh, PubMed has a pilot project in which they are indexing preprints from people, Jessica, correct me if I'm wrong, only authors who have NIH support at the moment and only COVID-19 related science. But this is a sort of harbinger of um, one hopes of other efforts that will expand in the future. Um, there are other conversations going on, uh, um, I know, amongst uh, the major indexing services um, about what to do about preprints. And I think we will see solutions um, coming from them uh, in the not too distant future. In the meantime, Google Scholar is a fantastic resource. Semantic Scholar, not so well known, but um, a very good one. Meta is another uh, service that provides indexing and the ability to um, collect, you know, preprints on particular uh, topics of your uh, of your particular interest. So uh, we, we don't lack tools, but they are slightly different tools to the sort of things that people are used to using with journal articles. Great, thank you. Uh, it'll be interesting to see the, the growth and changes in that space. Um, anything additional to add, Jessica? No, I think that was an incredible summary. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, okay, so the, the next uh, question here is, I think it's a, it's a really fascinating one. And in, in light of your presentation, John, I wonder if, if you want to maybe approach it first. Uh, with respect to journals requiring preprints, is there enough support, funding, and personnel in preprint servers uh, to review the influx of preprints? As managed? Well, um, <laughs> if you asked my four um, young colleagues who handled 52,000 manuscripts last year, they might say that, well, we are a bit lacking in, in, <laughs> in numbers. Um, so I, I think it's a fair, it's an entirely fair point. Um, we feel we are very fortunate to have the support that we have, um, which has allowed us to make the progress we have. But if the, uh, at the moment, I think it's maybe 5% of the biomedical literature is um, ex uh, manifest first as a preprint. If that becomes 50%, um, then we are going to need more resources, uh, more people, uh, more funding, and so on. And um, I think everyone, including our very generous funders, uh, is, a, is aware of that. And um, those are conversations and thinking that is ongoing at the moment. But for the moment, we are, we are, we're doing okay. And we also, one group that I haven't, that I didn't give sufficient mention to is this group of what we call affiliate scientists of whom in the case of BioArchive, we have 170 PIs around the world who, who provide the second layer of our screening process and MedArchive as an equivalent group, slightly smaller. But um, they are absolutely vital. They do what they do entirely out of the good of their hearts. And um, we rely on them a lot and, and can't thank them enough. That, that, can, that can scale because we are fortunate enough to have community support. So we don't lack for um, folks to help us in that respect. It's the internal team that is yeah. under you know, the kind of pressure I alluded to. That makes sense. We uh, we hope that you're you're a victim of your own success, and that <laughs> this continues, and that uh, you. <laughs> you know, the, the funders are, are are there to to support you in in, in doing what you're doing. Um, a, a couple more questions here, and and do keep them coming, folks. Um, the one here is uh, about um, whether or not funding agencies in Canada currently require the publishing of preprints. I might take a, a stab at that myself. Um, since both our speakers are, are American-based. Um, in, in Canada, no, there, there's no requirements uh, for, for that currently. I can say that the tri-agencies, including CIHR, which is relevant to many on the call, um, they do permit preprints uh, to be considered in grant applications, and they encourage them. And that, that's been for many years, but they've taken a, a more firm stance recently, uh, but no mandates at present. Uh, another question here. Uh, coming in from uh, Lori Pru, who's a patient partner at the Ottawa Hospital, uh, says, great presentation. She 
She's wondering about uh, whether increasing involvement of patient partners in research, uh, or with that in increasing involvement, whether you've observed any developments uh, to use preprints to engage communities affected by the research. So if there's been any intersection there. Uh, I don't know, Jessica, if you, you want to start. Yeah, I think um, it, to, to my, uh, not that I'm aware of, I think it is a really important issue. I think there's a, a tension um, between the fact that I think many researchers have viewed preprints as a way to communicate work prior to peer review among a community of researchers who are themselves perhaps equipped to act as peer reviewers or uh, provide feedback. The, but of course, that's not to say that, you know, preprints are not or should not. Uh, I think it's, a, it's very beneficial that they're open and that people can read them and have access to them. Um, I, I think that uh, I'd be really interested to hear if John has, if, you know, from the perspective of MedArchive is aware of, of uh, any initiatives like this, but um, currently, um, you know, I know that there are, uh, you know, there has been some interest in, you know, can preprints come with a more digestible summary um, that will help broad readers understand what's being said there. Certainly that's something I think is um, you know, requested or that I understand um, individuals may, may, may want. Um, I think that there's also, you know, the concerns that uh, we've been talking about, about um, making sure that patients are provided with really accurate and robust information, um, you know, perhaps in the context of some of these expert uh, peer review services that John mentioned, um, you know, that that may be a way of uh, engaging those who might be affected. Um, yeah, that's, I think this is a really good question. Um, as I said, our two of our partners um, in the management of MedArchive come from uh, BMJ, the British um, uh, health knowledge provider. And um, I actually met um, through them, I met uh, an editor for the BMJ journal who is um, a patient and a patient advocate. And she has a role in peer review at the journal. Um, we are in the process of assembling uh, an advisory board for MedArchive and we are very uh, intent on having representation from the patient and patient advocacy community. Um, so, but at the moment, we we haven't got active involvement from, from that group. Um, but in terms of the use of preprints, I think there are, I know there are informal groups of people with specific um, interests, for example, in, in particular rare diseases who monitor um, our servers for relevant um, content. And um, I think this is true. The Simons Foundation, which is active in funding autism research, has a group of participants and, and um, investigators, and they have, I think, a magazine that circulates within um, that community of people who are interested in autism. And I know they do a digest of particularly relevant preprints, um, I think, each month. So um, these things are happening. I, I, as Jessica said, I think our view of things like um, plain language summaries is that that's not something that the preprint server should do, but something that should be handled by an external third party service that has the expertise to do it properly. Thank you both. I think it's a, uh, you know, patient partnership and research is certainly growing and, and especially so in Canada. And it'll be interesting to see sort of those intersections where they're appropriate. Um, okay, a couple more questions here. So uh, there's a question here uh, asking what type of license is most often used for preprints? And, and maybe you can elaborate on, on why. Uh, we'll go to you first this time, John. Yes, yeah, so um, I should have these numbers off the top of my head, but um, Somewhat to the disappointment of some advocates for open science, um, we elected right at the beginning of BioArchive, and we've continued to do this with MedArchive, to give authors the choice um, rather than mandate a particular um, license. And, and the reason for that simply was that, you know, it was a hard enough job getting people to adopt preprints without then placing further constraints on um, how, how they handle 
preprints. So we offer, um, I think, the, the widest range of license choices possible, all the way from CC0 to, uh, and, uh, to, and CC BY through to all rights reserved. So um, roughly speaking, um, I think 30% of manuscripts on BioArchive are all verbs. Um, another roughly 40% is 40-50% um, is a different flavor of CC by, you know, NC, ND, NC, ND. Um, and then about 20% are um, CC by. So those are, those are the choices that authors are making. Um, they vary to some extent from discipline to discipline. Um, but we haven't actually done that analysis for some time. This is a reminder to me that we should go back and, and look at that, uh, particularly after the past year's events. Uh, but Jessica, you have more thoughts yeah. about licenses, I think. I think I might be one of those advocates you're referring <laughs> to, John. Um, yeah, I, I yeah. think that uh, my sense from, we've done some uh, small surveys within researchers. Um, I think that knowledge of licenses um, is not particularly high. And there, there were a couple of publishers who years ago um, dissuaded the use of Creative Commons licenses in, um, in preprints, which have since revised their policies. So I think that there is still this kind of lingering perception about license choice and perhaps a default to, to a more uh, conservative option. Um, it is not necessarily the most exciting topic, but I definitely think that one that is important to um, be, uh, you know, really fully understand. Yeah. I, I agree. Thank you, you both for, for sharing that. It's certainly my experience consulting locally in Ottawa as well. There's, there's just not that knowledge base on which to choose. So sometimes I don't know that people are necessarily are, are making the right choice or even know what choice they're making. Um, okay, so the next question here um, is, uh, there seems to be so many options for preprints these days, with new ones coming up regularly. How do we pick the right preprint server or determine if it is recognized and legitimate? Maybe we'll go to Jessica first for this one. Yeah, this is a really important question. And I think the concept of even, you know, what is, are the roles and responsibility of a preprint server and what, you know, what does that mean. I think, you know, I, um, certainly there's a broad range in the type of screening and moderation, which I think is one of the most important characteristics that uh, should be considered when we think about um, preprint servers. Some preprint servers do conduct a really rigorous uh, assessment, as which John mentioned. There's other places where uh, preprint servers and also, I should say, places where preprints can be found. For example, it's certainly possible to upload um, a a document that in other in every other way resembles a preprint on, for example, Zenodo. Um, and there's been some very um, you know, infamous cases of documents getting a lot of traction. Um, it, of course, a, a repository like Zenodo does not perform any pre-screening. And so I think there's this perception that there's a, a kind of um, sense of legitimacy because it is on this scholarly resource that does not actually, but but at the same time, it's not really perhaps clear to readers that um, this hasn't been looked at um, by a human um, in, in any significant way. So I think that one thing that we are really interested in um, is um, a, a, you know, very uh, appreciative of preprint servers who make their screening policies very, very clear and make it clear um, what has been done prior to the, the preprint appearing there. Um, I think that the other issues are relating to things like, um, is the preprint server going to be visible in your community? So number one, you know, who uh, what are other people going to be looking there? I think this, there's a, co a question in the comments about scooping. I think scooping concerns are kind of inversely proportional to how visible a preprint is within a community. And so I think that obviously the, the sites with a lot of traction among a certain group of researchers are going to be a, um, a, you know, helpful in reaping those benefits of visibility. Um, that includes things like where the content is indexed. Um, I think preprint servers, and that in turn, it can be affected by things like, does the preprint server have a preservation policy to ensure that the content is stably available? Um, so I, I definitely feel like on the practical level, this question about visibility 
is probably the most important factor, but there's all of these other issues surrounding trust. This is the, uh, whether the content will continue to be available um, and so forth that impact a decision on where to, where to post. So yeah, curious if John has anything to add. No, not really, Jessica. I think you've hit the nail on the head. I mean, there is a lot of variation and um, there are lots of choices now. Um, some servers are um, discipline based, some are country based even, some are even language based. So um, yeah, I, th I think one has to do some due diligence um, and all the points that Jessica made are entirely valid. Um, there's usually enough information, I think, on the sites of the servers concerned for you to um, get some understanding of, of where they're coming from, who runs them, what the motivation is, um, and so on. So I would encourage everyone to look at that. And, and the um, uh, directory that uh, ASAP Bio has on its website is, is a, a genuinely valuable source of all of that information. And I see that uh, Jessica's just popped the directory into the chat, uh, which is super helpful because uh, unfortunately we, we've reached the end of our time together and there are definitely still are additional questions. So I apologize we couldn't get to them all in the session, but I, I think it's been a really interesting discussion and uh, I want to thank both John and Jessica for their time and uh, you know, having the ability to chat sort of directly in this Q&A is, is really uh, been very helpful for me. And you know, we see there's lots of interest in this space. So. Uh, thank you for your talks today, but also thank you for, for the work you're doing for the community and, and really um, really innovating in this space. So uh, I'll stop there and lots of thank yous pouring in in the chat as well. So thank you again. Well, thank you very much, Kelly, for the invitation. If anybody has a question that they think I could answer, please don't hesitate to contact me by email um, and um, I'd be happy to do that. Thank you for the opportunity to talk to this community. And I, I see someone's asked for the recording and we will post uh, the recording on our uh, YouTube page. So I'll circulate that to those who've registered.